Dat staat nu op YouTube. Bye. Onder. Uh, of bij Fotido's. Dat staat nu op mijn account. Fotido's heeft geen account. Maar, ja. Ik wil haar. Dus ik kan achteraf wel wat de feiten staan, maar... Uh, en wanneer denk je dat je het klaar hebt? Ja, dat denk ik. Oh, dat is goed. Wanneer is het klaar? Ik sta ook liever aan die kant. Nee, maar dit, dit staat op de camera, dus alleen dat stukje. Ja, maar jij klikt de camera, die kun je bedienen. Nee, maar die blijft gewoon zo staan. Ja? Ja, verbetering is Ik heb namelijk de scherm heb ik zo, en ik hoef alleen maar de spreker, en die moet toch daar blijven staan, want daar is de microfoon. Oké, okay. en als hij ziet, dan krijg je dat ook in beeld? Ja, hier. Oh, perfect. Perfect. En, uh... So, hello everyone. Hello, everyone. It's good to be back at Tidos, and thank you. To the organizers for giving me the chance to talk <coughs> here at the keynote. I'm going to be talking about communication applications and specifically why being open source is just the first step in doing this. My name is Neophytos Kolobatronis. I know that might sound strange to you. Uh, it sure did for the organizers. They, for some reason, thought I'm from a, a comic hero from Asterix. <laughs> But yeah, I, I come from Cyprus, it's a small island on the Eastern Mediterranean, an island country. And if my name sounds Greek to you, you can just call me Neo. I'm a long time free software uh, contributor and activist. I am currently a community manager at several open source projects. And I'm also a founding member of the Cypriot uh, and Open Source Association. Now, before I move on, I'd like to clear out that I'm not a coder, so I'm going to be talking about technical things that I don't so understand so deeply, but I am interested in how these technologies are implemented and how they affect our lives and our privacy and our digital rights in general. So any mistakes I might make or forgot, please point them out in the end, and it's not intentional. So I'm going to be talking about internet-based mobile messenger applications. <laughs> we all know it's a new standard nowadays. Nobody, uh, they, we used to use texting a lot and maybe doing some phone calls, but nowadays more and more applications come out using the internet to text. Their main advantage is that they are free of charge, and of course you can also, for low or no charge at all, do group chats and audio and video calls. And this is only increasing their usage for everyone. Now, if you're like me, you're probably using like four or five different apps to contact your friends or family or colleagues, maybe. I don't know, does any of you use actually any open source apps? Ah, you do. That's good. Maybe you'll find some of this in this talk, maybe you will not. We'll see. So I'm going mostly to be talk focusing on instant messenger applications that are internet-based. They do have mobile clients for usability and they are, of course, open source going to be talking about their strengths and their weaknesses and if and how they offer freedom and power to the end user. What do we usually share on uh, through these messaging applications? We tend to think we must share our pet pics, our cats and dogs, maybe our food, we we'll put that on to share it with our friends and random silly thoughts of everyday living. But we should not forget that also we include lots of private thoughts often many personal photos of our children, of our partners, maybe even ourselves. Our beliefs, maybe it's regarding religion or maybe it's about uh, um, politics, which is also very important. Maybe secrets that we don't want other people to know about. And of course, personal details, maybe those are regarding your health or maybe financial ones. We share also a lot of these things and all these things say a story about us and they allow the people to handle our communications to build a profile on us that maybe it's based on facts, but it's not necessarily the truth, or we don't feel that that profile fits us and who we are and what we think. Now, in short, what is privacy? Privacy, in a general term, is the ability to be secluded from others, so you can be on your own, and also it's the ability to choose what you want to share with others. So, 
It often overlaps with secrecy and anonymity, but they are kind of different. Secrecy is about intentionally want to keep some information hidden. And anonymity is about concealing your identity. So you might be doing actually things in public, but you might have your identity concealed, so nobody knows who you are, even though they know what you're doing. And also it could be the opposite. You might be doing things in private, but people know who you are. <coughs> so I came across this uh, quote that kind of stuck with me. It's about secrecy and privacy. I know what you do in the bathroom, but you still close the door to do it. So that, in a way, is privacy. And we all do it. We all know what others do, but we still close the door. Well, we don't want someone looking over our shoulder while doing it, um, unless maybe it's your dog or your partner, if you are past that stage in your relationship. Uh, regarding communications, we know nowadays that we, with the internet, the digital era and all that, well, information is free available to everyone. But unfortunately, lots of that information is uh, only for a few limited entities that have access to a bit more information than us. Not all the information is available to us. And as we know, information and knowledge are power, and power will probably be abused if in the hands, in their own hands. <coughs> Who usually gathers this kind of information? It's usually governments that tend to abuse it when they have it. There are authoritarian regimes that it's a heaven for them, storing data on their people and being able to oppress them in that way. And of course, companies that actually monetize on our personal data and all the information we exchange online. So this can have important implications, both on a personal level, a social, a political, and a financial one. Uh, on a personal level, we know that surveillance and being constantly surveilled changes our behavior and how we act and behave. On a social level, this can have uh, issues on free speech and activism because it suppresses, it can be used to suppress people and not allow ideas to flow and exchange. On a political level, we know that opinions can be manipulated. We've seen recently in the elections in the US how people's thoughts and uh, profiles uh, were actually used to deliver information to them and change their opinions about the subjects. And of course, if you have information on a politician, a future president or anything, you can threaten them and you can influence them in a way. And in the free market concept, you need to have a way to keep your ideas in secret hidden. Now, I probably don't have to explain in this audience why being open source is it's important, but yeah, it's an essential first step. If you are using an application for, to communicate, you want it, you really want it to be open sourced for the obvious reasons, being able to verify what it does, to audit it at any time, to be transparency and build that with your users and, and uh, with other companies you might be working with. And of course, it gives everyone the ability to self-host it if needed, maybe that's uh, company or a user, it doesn't really matter. But unfortunately, that's not enough on its own. There are additional concerns. Is the server implementation also open source? Because we tend to think as open source only on our mobile or on our, the client we use, but very often it's also a server. And are, what are the policies that this server uses? Do they work for your privacy? Do they care about your privacy? They, of course, store data and metadata very often. There are issues of compatibility and interoperability. So can your client work with another client? Can you talk with friends on another network? Most often you can't, especially on proprietary applications. That want to, to keep you in closed platforms and like wall gardens so you can be a consumer. They can, all, they can only be the ones that keep your data and your profiles, and they want to keep you in their um, ecosystem. And of course, if you're using just one service, you have the issue of being censored or being denied that service for whatever reason that might be. What can help us here? We can use things like encryption, federation, and decentralization that I'm going to explain a bit to help us uh, 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 address these concerns. Starting from encryption, you probably all know what this it is. It's the process of encoding a message of information so that only the parties that are actually discussing it in a chat are, have access to it. We have some expanded standards from our encryption, so it's about confidentiality, so you know that only you and the person you, you want to talk to is the one being able to access those messages. You have authenticity, so 
you know that you are actually talking and getting responses for the person you are meant to be talking and getting responses. There's not someone out there maybe stolen their identity or something. You want integrity, so your message when you transmit it is, is received and then the answer is received by you as it was supposed to be. And there's also deniability, your chance to deny having said that. We have that in real life. If you're discarding someone, maybe you can later deny that. For encryption, it's very, very important to be end-to-end. -end. That means that no matter the internet service you are using, the communication service you are using, or the client you are using, the application itself, it doesn't matter. Nobody can have access to your information, only you and the person you are sending the messages. There are some things to note about encryption and its implementation. First is the perfect forward secrecy. This is very important to have. It means that even though you are key, encryption uses keys to exchange keys to authorize and identify people. So you want, uh, if somebody compromises your key, you, if there is perfect forward secrecy, that means that your past and future history is not compromised. So they can only see um, the messages relating to that key which are usually temporary. That's very important. Also, it's also important to have to be using a widely accepted methodology that has been reviewed and has been audited and it has been proven to work. So a common saying is never to roll your own uh, encryption methods. Of course, it's important, as we said, to be on source. And a big issue also with encryption, it's, it's very complicated to do, especially in communications. So you want to keep it simple if you want to your users to be uh, using actually that software. If it's complicated, it doesn't make too much sense. Maybe for some tech enthusiasts, some geeks, but yeah, if you want the majority of people to be using your software, it's very important to be simple to use. But even though we might be using encryption, very, very often there is the issue of metadata. That's data regarding who, when, where, usually, that is probably available to the service you're using, especially if it's on a server client model. We'll talk about that in a bit. That has to do about your online presence, about your time and frequency you're contacting other people, the origin, of course, and the destination, and any contact information you might have stored that they have access to. And all, all these two tend to give a profile about you. I think there's a talk uh, later today about metadata, actually. There are three important architectures that are usually used in communication apps, uh, centralized, most this is a very common model, and you've seen it in proprietary applications like WhatsApp and Viber and all that. They are usually centralized, like there is a, one provider that has all the servers in there. Uh, they host all the servers, and you can communicate with other clients only via their server. There is also what we call federation, when uh, you have multiple servers and multiple networks that are the, have the ability to connect with each other, and you can talk with other friends and other contacts on other networks. So you might be uh, on using one application and you want to contact your friend using another application on another network and you can do that. And there is also decentralization, which means that that's basically peer-to-peer -peer technology. You talk directly to your contacts. You don't have any server client model. That, that's obsolete. You only have clients that are actually both clients and servers and you have connections directly be between your peers. Now, starting by centralized services, uh, there are advantages, of course, that one entire for the company hosting them or the provider is that they have full authority over them. So they can quickly deploy any changes they want or new features they want. And they can keep some standards of their own about the, regarding the quality of their product and their brand name. But for the users, of course, of course there are disadvantages because all their data is kept under one entirety and all the metadata is stored and are untidy, you get to receive all the changes that are also you. So if you get an update, you don't really have an option other than to re receive that change. And there might be anti features or things that you really don't want there. And you can't really change because of that. So it's like a closed platform. You can't switch to another provider if you don't like something on the application or the service they are providing to you. And of course, as I said earlier, on centralized system, there's always the issue that if they want, in some extreme cases, maybe the government or a company would can and maybe they will block you from their services. It could be because you're not paying or because you have issues with the government or whatever. Now, federation, as I said, is about the ability of independent instances of a service to be able to communicate with each other. 
And full federation is independent of your client and your provider. So common examples are email and SMS. It doesn't matter which application you're using on which operating system, you can exchange email with everyone and also SMS. The advantages is that everyone can set up and run individual servers that, and users can actually choose among providers and they can switch between networks, ideally, if that's allowed by the technology. It's been very difficult to be denied access to a service because you, if they say no, you can join another network and you can still reach your contacts. And it's, for the same reason, difficult to bring that down because there are probably more than one server running from independent agencies. And of course, your data and users' data are spread among different uh, instances. So there's no one entirely holding all the data. But this also has its advantages because uh, there might be inconsistencies. Maybe you are using a client that has a feature that you want to use, but the other person using another client or another service doesn't have that feature. So that might be an issue and a bit frustrating for some. And also you can switch between providers so you can choose what features you want and what features you prefer. But this might actually be a, an advantage for some people. There is still, even in federation, there's a server client model that you, your information still needs to pass through some servers to reach the other person. And as usual, it's very, very, very difficult to reach common standards, so you can have interoperability. So uh, you need to decide on the common standards if you want people to decide in or around a proper maybe APIs for your networks to be connected. Finally, decentralization is about distributing the authority and the control from a main uh, authority to the users, actually, to the end users, those that actually use the service. And a great example of this are peer-to-peer -peer technologies. You might have heard of them via yeah, torrents or something. Um, they have several great advantages that they don't have a, a dependency on a central provider. So as we said, the server client model is kind of obsolete here. And it's very, very difficult to censor you on this kind of network because you have direct access to all your peers. And nobody can get in between and block you. It, it can't deny you any service, and it's very difficult. There's no single point of uh, failure, so it can't be, um, it can't, uh, be brought down or even by attack or uh, uh, something wrong with the service. The disadvantages in the cast communication applications is that usually this uh, type of networks are demanding on resources because you are the server and client, you have to maintain connections all the time with uh, your peers. So there is lots of bandwidth usage, yeah, and of course battery drain if you are using it on mobile. And there is usually no offline messages because there is no server to store that message until it's delivered if you are contact and you are offline. So for your message to be delivered, you usually have to wait until both contacts are online. And then you, our message will be delivered. And this some causes some issues with asynchronous communication that might complicate things. And there is usually no automatic contact discovery. And that I'm going to be talking about some applications uh, here that are decentralized, but unfortunately most of them are still in development, but they are getting there. Now, these are the applications I'm going to be presenting now. They are centralized, federated, and decentralized. Let's start with the first. Ah, the known issues. The, there are indeed some known issues about what do we consider FOSS when we are talking about open source. I usually follow the F trade policies on what I use on my mobile. Maybe you, you have other um, preferences or priorities. And according to F trade, the software they ship it usually has to be, of course, not open source, it, and it has to it has to avoid including any proprietary dependencies, and those are usually related to Google's uh, cloud messaging and mobile services. Now I'm, I'm focusing here on Android as let's consider it a more open platform. So yeah, shipping uh, Google's proprietary services is a big issue, as you would see in most apps. But fortunately, that, uh, there are apps that are working on this as we move on. And of course, you can't ship any binaries with your code. Another big issue with applications is the distribution of their APKs, uh, how you get access to it, how do you download it. If you want to avoid Google or any other service, you probably don't want to download, be downloading them from the Google Store. So. It's very important to have other means to download your applications and distribute them. Some good news about this is that we recently heard from some F3 developers that uh, Google is actually considering moving their play services and under a new name, and they do are considering open sourcing, but that remains to be seen if they actually plan and do this. But that's some good news. Now, let's start from 
Telegram. Telegram is probably the most popular application I'm going to be presenting today. And it's, it started as, uh, as a WhatsApp alternative back in the days, and I was actually recommending it back then, especially because it offered an open source client and it had uh, the possibility to, uh, for end-to-end -end encryption back when popular applications didn't. It, it was cross-platform, so, and you could synchronize your history among devices. A great advantage of Telegram is that nowadays it, has, it can bridge to other networks, so you might be following IRC through Telegram or maybe Slack or any other communication app you might be using for your job or things like that. And it allows also for audio calls, uh, most centralized applications because they keep, tend to keep your contacts, they all have automatic contact discovery, so if your contact is on your phone, you will probably have them immediately on the application. Now, why did I stop recommending Telegram? They never really open source their servers, so it's still proprietary, their implementation. They never really enable end-to-end -end encryption to reach all users. They still have it as an option. You have to enable by yourself, and they don't have it for group chats as well. And of course, because of that, they keep all your data on their servers and metadata. And it also received a lot of criticism, Telegram, because it's not using like a common and um, widely approved uh, uh, encryption implementation. It's actually using their own protocol. It's called mproto, I think. It might be wrong there, but yeah. So that is a lot of criticism, that it's not a proven network, but it's supposed to work. Now, Signal. Signal, you probably heard it after the Snowder uh, story that came up. He recommended it actually and gave a lot of momentum after that. It's very popular. It's probably the most popular privacy aware uh, application to recommend. It's got its strengths because it's open source both on the client and the server. There are some issues, but we'll look at them later. Uh, they, on, they only have end-to-end -end encryption by default, so that's your only option. There, no, there is no fallback, fallback, so that's important. It means all users get the encryption directly. They use a widely accepted encryption protocol. They, they are developers actually developed, and it's nowadays being used, as we will see, by other applications, and also popular li uh, applications like WhatsApp and Viber. They have all implemented some kind uh, of solution based on the same protocol. So it's a very strong uh, protocol to use. They nowadays support video and audio calls, and they make them peer-to-peer, -peer, so your calls are not through a server, and they are sometimes go through a server if you want to hide your identity in specific cases, but they are mostly peer-to-peer, -peer and that's important. And they made uh, using the application, even though it has all this important security behind it, they, made actu they actually made it uh, easy to use for users. It's not that complicated. It looks like other applications you are probably be using, which wasn't the, um, the truth regarding other applications at the time. Now, uh, what's wrong about uh, Signal? They do admit of storing some of your metadata, some often temporarily, just to have their communication secure. But uh, they have been criticized, mostly by the open source community, for not uh, adopting the open source culture. And mostly, they don't allow any, even though they open source their servers, their server implementation, the code, they don't allow for anyone to provide to provide their own server in their network. You can set up if you want your own server, but you, you your client will not be able to contact the other Signal clients on their network. So it will be an independent solution if you go, want to go that way. And even though they open source their code as well, you can't. They don't allow for independent builds of their applications to be delivered. So they are, they are kind of demanding to maintain control over their service, even though the, their code is actually open source. And of course, you require a phone number to register. Now, the third uh, centralized application is Wire. Uh, Wire actually started as a Skype alternative. Uh, it allowed for very good video and audio calls, and it also allowed those to be uh, group calls as well. It's got also into an encryption by default, based on the Signal protocol, actually. It allows you to register without your phone number, and that's a good thing. You can use your email. It has great multi-device synchronization, and it's cross-platform with a FOSS client. And, but they haven't still open source everything about their FOSS server, so they started to do that recently. But there's still uh, lots of documentation missing de depend, uh, about how to self-host that, and how to make federation work with their network. So you can't, even though they started open source things, 
there are still limitations of what you can do with the source code they offered. And there is an issue because they still have Google dependencies on their Android clients. <laughs> and there was some, like a story you know, some time ago about uh, uh, storing plain text, your contacts in plain text of their services. And they responded by saying that this is kind of needed to enable syncing across devices, and they are looking for alternatives on how to solve that. Now, we'll move to federated applications. First, we'll start with Contoc. I'm actually, I don't know if you noticed know from my earlier slides, but I'm actually involved in Contoc myself. I try to be objective here. But yeah, uh, what attracted me initially in Contoc is that they, by default, it, they, by design, they always use open source for their client and server as well. And they are using a federated network like XMPP to build that service on top. They do often end-to-end -end encryption by default based on the OpenPGP protocol over XMPP. And they offer automatic discovery that makes it easy. It, it works like most apps to discover your contacts. Now, I might be a bit harsh here because I know things about Contoc, so I know what's wrong with it. But yeah, it, it takes, the Contoc takes the time. Most centralized uh, applications don't really hash your uh, phone number when they transmit it. Contoc takes the time to do that, even though we nowadays know that hashes and are breakable. If enough resources and skills are there, one can break that. But anyway, it's one thing that is an advantage. Encryption is not. Uh, it does not support perfect forward secrecy, so if somebody steals your kit at the moment, they can probably have access to your other and, and, uh, your past conversations as well. But OMIMO support is like uh, an implementation of the Signal protocol over XMPP. It's planned to be some, delivered sometime soon, and that will resolve this issue. And unfortunately, the encryption that is using Cotton is kind of a custom. Uh, implementations, so it doesn't work with other XMPP clients outside the quantum network. That's another issue that OMIMO will probably solve. There is some data data stored on the service for a limited amount of time, other than your contacts and uh, uh, the um, times of your communication. Only, it's only for text messaging, and unfortunately, we, even though it's an open network, nobody, nobody has cared enough yet to offer a second alternative. So it's, even though it's federated and you can have multiple implementations of the same server, only one server run by the developer's contact is actually available at the moment. Uh, one of the first applications to, uh, on, for mobile messaging uh, it was Conversations that is also completely open source, both, both server and uh, client. It's based also on the XMPP network, and uh, it can actually talk to Contoc if you, if you don't use encryption. And maybe uh, they do offer, Conversations also offers off-the-record off OpenGP PGP, and OMIMO as a choice, so they give you a choice of encryption. So if you are using another application with OMIMO support of the XMPP network, Provided they have solved the issues, they can talk to each other. That's good for federation. It's federated by default because it's using the XMPP protocol. So you can use any client of XMPP on your desktop or mobile to talk with other contacts. And uh, they give you the option to actually, if you want more anonymity, to use it over Tor. So that's powerful. And you don't have to use a phone number. You can, uh, you can register pretty much anonymously by giving your name. Your nickname or something. Now, what's wrong about conversations? It's actually a bit of a complicated. I don't know how many of you use it, but it's rather complicated to use. There's lots of settings and things to set up before you start using it. And they do acknowledge that. So they are now offering Zone uh, as an alternative. It's like a new application that is focused mostly for usability. It's only focused on that, providing usability over encryption for the daily user. And unfortunately, you have there is no end-to-end -end encryption enabled by default, and it's not also not enabled by default on group chats. If you are using conversation, have that in mind. And of course, all the non-end-to-end -non -end encrypted data can't be stored on their servers, and it's only for text messaging. Now, a very popular nowadays getting a lot of momentum, Riot, over the Matrix protocol. You might have heard of, if you've heard of the Libre 5 phone, they had a successful campaign recently. It's like a privacy-focused uh, uh, mobile phone. And uh, they do plan to ship Riot as the default um, communication platform in their device. So it's gaining a, a bit of momentum Riot at the moment. 
uh, it, it's completely open source. It's based on the matrix protocol, so it's federated. It allows you to connect with other matrix instances across the uh, network. And of course, it pitches with other services, which is also important. I personally use it as an IRC bouncer. I, use, I keep it, it's easy to follow channels through it. And of, they, are, they offer end-to-end -end encryption, even though it's still in beta at the moment, but it's a good encryption based on the signal protocol, so that's important. And they don't require, again, any phone number or email to join them. Um, the criticism, as I said, the end-to-end -end encryption is still in beta, so that aspect is kind of, it needs to work. And it's a bit complicated to use if you are using especially medical devices, that becomes an issue. And it's not enabled yet by default in all their services. And since they are using servers, they do store metadata and data. And it's kind of complicated to use because actually use Riot, I've replaced Skype with it early on. And I use it to talk with my family and sometimes my mother gets lost in the settings. She loses the window and she... So there are some usability issues about it. But it's, it really works if you're, if you're using Skype, you can easily switch to Riot or another application that supports video calling. Now, decentralized applications. Here it gets a bit interesting. Maybe you haven't heard most of them, but yeah, there are definitely some ambitious projects going on here. Uh, there's, first of all, Briar. Briar, uh, as I said, most of these applications are still in beta and are now just going public slowly, but there's lots of development going on behind them. Briar is an ambitious project. They actually, uh, they are open source by default and they offer peer-to-peer -peer internet encryption. They are actually using a protocol, I think it's called Brabble, and they want to offer other services on top of that protocol, decentralized services, maybe forum, or maybe the ability to host the forum, or have collaboration tools on top of that. It's not just about communications, even though they are now mostly focused on that. It connects via Tor, so there's uh, very little metadata that gets transferred on, online. And what's very unique about Briar is that it can actually work without internet connection. So you can connect with your friends through Bluetooth or Wi-Fi. Uh, in, maybe it's not very, uh, we don't find it very useful in most advanced and developed countries, but in cases of a, a crisis or maybe a riot or things like that, we have seen uh, situations where um, the internet was down. The, the government chose to bring the internet down, maybe in riots in the Arab countries, or we have seen in the past um, uh, people being blocked to join Telegram or Signal in Egypt when there was a riot there and in China as well. So it's important uh, to, to be able to communicate with other persons when there is no internet in your area. Maybe you're planning something, maybe you want to have um, some activism uh, actions. So it's important to be able to do that. And. Uh, for extra authenticity, they do require you, though, to be able to meet in person to actually exchange keys. There are workarounds about that, but it gets kind of complicated. And this, that's also a downside. You cannot remotely add contacts. So that's a big issue. Even though there is a possibility of introducing contacts to another. So if you have met with someone and you're already connected, there is a possibility to connect for that person to connect you to another one and introduce it without being probably in person. There are still no audio and video call support and no offline message, as we already said. I've actually mentioned more of this. And it's currently still called an issue of getting into F3 because it ships with binary jars, but hopefully that will be resolved as well. Now, Tox is another decentralized application, also open source completely, and with abilities for peer to peer end to end encryption based on the NACL library. That's a different methodology. Uh, they actually care to conceal all your metadata through onion routing, your information, it's more or less what Tor is using, but they allow you also to use on top of it Tor. So if you care about anonymity, it's very important for you, for your own reasons, then they, they give you lots of choices. And they do have the ability to work among very many devices. You can choose your own client. They, they host all sorts of applications for all sorts of desktop and mobile. Uh, now, it, it gets a bit complicated because they use these hashes, so if you want to add another user, you have to exchange the big hash with them, what they call it Tox ID. They do offer some easier solutions, but they suggest against them if you care about security. And, of course, since there are many clients, they suffer from that, that you, there might be inconsistencies and usability varies among them. And, as always, they are not of, there's no time and they are demanding on resources of all these apps. 
And finally, Ring. <laughs> Ring uh, is actually recently joined the GNU Foundation, so might, that might be important for you. It's completely open source. It uses, again, peer-to-peer end-to-end -end encryption over the OpenDHT protocol this time. And you might have heard of SFL phone. Actually, Ring is based on that, so it comes in with built-in SIP uh, compatibility. So you can use that if you care, or if you are already using it for your job or company. It's cross-platform, and it supports also video and audio calls through their network. They do point out, though, that anonymity is not assured on their network, and that some metadata can be uh, transferred and be observed, because they use these nodes for communication over the DHT protocol. And they again use these weird hashes uh, for contact discovery, which kind of complicates things for most users for daily communications. And in my case, I wanted to test this for the purposes of this application to be updated. I had used it in the past. And I, I couldn't find oh, something wrong there. Uh, sorry. Yeah, yeah, we are. I couldn't find any way to install it and update the ring application on my system for whatever reason. And on F3, it was a very outdated version, and on desktop, it only had versions for the latest Ubuntu, I think, uh, uh, distribution. Anyway, so you should, it's very important here. We've seen that there are many options you can choose for, but it's very, very important to know what you're looking for in an application. There is obviously no one app to rule them all. It's, very difficult to do that because it's very difficult to combine quality encryption with simplicity or strong privacy with usability or the ability to be able to choose with being centralized and have all the benefits that come with that. So depending on what who you are and what you want from the application, you have probably different needs. You might be a casual user, so you care mostly about simplicity. There are applications, fortunately, to do that. You might be a whistleblower, though, or a journalist working on some specific case. So you want extra protection if you are someone in that. And you might be a citizen in an oppressive regime, so you want additional layers of privacy and security. Maybe you want offline as well communication, which is important. So we all have different needs and priorities. There is. Uh, uh, there are many things we can prioritize. Maybe for some of us, it's very important for the application we use to be open source. For others, maybe anonymity is very important, and not all applications uh, offer that. It's actually one of the most difficult things to be anonymous online. Maybe you want the freedom to choose between networks. Maybe you want to you want the, to avoid centralized services. But you want to avoid the server client model. So it all comes down to your needs. What's the biggest problem that all these applications face? Well, for starters, uh, not enough people care about privacy. So that's an issue. And even if they do care, are we all aware of our choices of that the, uh, there are quality open source alternatives to the popular applications that proprietary ones that we tend to use? And of course, in the end, the biggest issue that even that all applications actually suffer, all or network type of applications, is that can we have our contacts available on that network? And unfortunately, it's not that easy. Um, as even Macklin pointed out, privacy is an ecological problem, and it's more or less like second car smoking. You might be the if you are only the only one person in the room that is not smoking, you are probably suffer as well uh, with the rest. So the weakest link is actually your contact that doesn't care about privacy. Because you, you, to communicate with them, you need to use what they use. So if you can't move them on to your side, so if you can't stop them from smoking, then you are also affected with them when you are with them, like with smoking. So it's kind of a, a thing we all have to do if we want to protect against it. Now, what can we do? We can advocate. We can try to inform, take the time to inform, if we care, of course to inform our contacts on the benefit of using these privacy respecting applications. It's uh, always choose the applications you suggest. So if your user is like, I don't know, your mother or your, your tech friend, you probably want to suggest uh, other types of applications to them. So it's important to choose an application that the user would not that just uh, not be able to use. And always, if you are a coder or maybe care about these things, try to watch your concept with developers. There are constructive ways to do that. And often enough, they do care, and they might take in your concerns and work on them. And of course, if you can contribute in any other way, as most open, you know, most open source projects, you are welcome to do that. 
Now, what should you keep from this message, from this uh, talk? That privacy in communications is actually achievable. We often hear online that the privacy is dead or things like that, and that's actually a bad rumor to, to spread because it makes people feel helpless. But if they know they have alternatives and they have these options, they might choose it. There are very good quality FOSS alternatives to proprietary applications we all tend to use. And there are things like encryption, federation, and decentralization that actually matter, and you should look into them. And choose, of course, an application that matches your needs and your contacts' needs. If you found this interesting, there is lots of further reading to do here. And of course, I'd like to thank uh, the people that helped me with the presentation. And this is the host software I've used. Thank you very, very much for your time. And you can ask me anything or leave a comment now. <laughs> So are there any questions? No? Yeah. Do you need? Yeah. Yeah, I've actually looked into my Mattermost and the racket chat, but I wanted to mostly focus on everyday communication. Mattermost is mostly focused on team teamwork and collaboration on that level. There are alternatives on that as well. Mattermost is a great alternative for Slack. If somebody uses Slack and wants to switch to an open source, Mattermost is a great application to do that. And also Racket Chat, I think it's called. It's also a great alternative for that, yeah. But I wanted to focus like on daily communication through mobile clients, not on the business level, right? Or team, but that's a good point. Anyone else? Yeah. Yeah, you have to register your phone number. <laughs> yeah, the, that's why I'm talking on internet-based communication, though, because you, if you can use the internet well, most of the time. And actually, I mentioned the Reprev iPhone, that they plan to s s deliver it with uh, their main focus being, a, being to be used through Riot, so it's through internet communication. So if that's encrypted and it's through the internet, if it's end-to-end -end encrypted, then that is kind of solved. But yeah, phone calls and SMSs and all that is a major issue. And you can't nowadays, in most countries, one after another, they, you can have a burner phone, you can't have one-time usage or you can't have an anon anonymous usage of phone numbers. You are always tied to the uh, phone number. Even though these are some applications use this to offer uh, automated contact discovery. So if you have your contact list and you use your number, so you can discover easily since this is the most uh, like popular way to use it nowadays. You want to mention? No? Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, but if you are using these applications that work over internet, they are kind of, because they use end-to-end encryption, in a way, I'm not probably the most technical person to talk about that, but the way I understand it, they are, they go through this tunnel that is supposed to be end-to-end -end encryption, so even, it doesn't matter which service is, uh, is being used to communicate these messages, since, they are, since they, that's the whole point of end-to-end -end encryption, actually, since they are being used. Now, that might have issues in terms of anonymity, of course. It gives, you, it gives you privacy because no one can access them, but you have probably be identified since your origin is your phone number in there. Yeah, that's an issue. Yeah, unfortunately. But who knows? Maybe we get that to sooner or later. Yeah. To drop finally GSM because that's all proprietary and SMS and all that. Anything else? Thank you then, thank you very much.